Red Badge of Courage, Chapter 20. Uh, soon they knew that no, no fighting threatened them. All ways seemed once more open to them. The dusty blue lines of their friends were seen a short distance away. Far away there were great noises, but in all this part of the field there was a sudden stillness. So they fought off this counterattack, and all of a sudden it's suddenly surreal, surreally still, uh, very serene on that part of the battlefield. They felt that they were free. The small group took a long breath of relief and gathered itself to complete its trip. Is it going forward or backward? I'm not sure at this point. In this last length of the journey, the men began to show strange emotions. They hurried with nervous fear. Some who had been brave in the fiercest moment now could not hide their anxious feelings. Again, sort of some thoughts on bravery there. Um, it's not a consistent trait. Just because you're brave in one instance doesn't mean you're going to be brave in every instance. Um, it was perhaps that they did not wish to be killed in unimportant ways after the time for proper military deaths had passed. That's an interesting observation, too. Does the, does the way you die matter in battle? You don't want to get killed in, in a non-engagement, right? Uh, you want to be killed in actual fighting that matters. Um, so that's, that's an interesting idea. And so they hurried. As they approached their own forces, so they're retreating. Um, there was some rough remarks by another regiment that lay resting in the shade of the trees. Where do you think you've been? Where are you coming back for? What are you coming back for? Why didn't you stay there? Was it too warm out there, sir? Going home now, boys? Oh, look at the soldiers. Yeah, so the, the, another regiment's mocking them for, for retreating. There was no reply from the hurt and shaken regiment. The youth's tender emotions were deeply burned by these remarks. Then they turned to turned when they arrived at their old position to regard the ground over which they had rushed. The youth was shocked. He discovered that the distances compared with the huge measurings in his mind were small indeed. The trees, where much happened, seemed unbelievably near. So they didn't get very far, I guess is the, the message there. It felt like a really long time, um, but it, it was a short amount of time and a short distance. Too, he, the time, too, he realized had been short. He wondered about the emotions and the events that had been crowded into such little spaces. Tricks played by the thoughts of the moment must have enlarged everything, he felt. And I guess maybe that's true. Like, when you're, when you're in intense danger, time seems to protract or, or expand or take longer. And uh, things, things seem like they happened over a long period of time. That was just a very short period of time. And that's what he's commenting on there. It seemed then that there was some bitter justice in the speeches of the other regiment. He looked down upon his, his friends lying upon the ground, breathless with dust and heat. They were drinking from their canteens, fierce to get every drop of water. However, to the youth, there was considerable joy in thinking of his own performances during the attack. Here he goes introspecting, um, thinking about himself again. There had been very little time before in which to admire himself, so now there was much satisfaction in quietly thinking of his actions. He remembered things that in the battle had sunk unnoticed into his mind. As the regiment lay catching its breath, the officer who had named them to make the attack came up on his horse, not the general, but the other one. He stopped the animal with an angry pull near the colonel of the regiment. He immediately began blaming the colonel in strong words, which came clearly to the ears of the men. What an awful job you made of the thing. You're killing me every time. What an awful job you made of the thing, McChesney. Good Lord, man, you stopped about a hundred feet before a very fine success. If your men had gone another hundred feet, you would have made a great attack. But as it is, what a lot of mud diggers you've got. The men listened quietly, now turned their curious eye upon the colonel. They had a real interest in this manner. The colonel straightened himself and put one hand forth in a speech-making fashion. He wore a hurt look, as if it was, as if a minister had been blamed for stealing. The men were excited. But suddenly the colonel's manner changed. He shook his head. Oh, well, general. We went as far as we could, he said calmly. As far as you could, did you? By God, said the general. Well, that wasn't very far, was it? He looked with cold anger into the other's eyes. Not very far, I think. He turned his horse and rode stiffly away. The news that the regiment had been blamed went along the line. From time to time, the, sorry, for a time, the men were surprised by it. They stared at the dis disappearing form of the general. They thought it must be a huge mistake. In a short time, however, they began to believe 
that in truth their efforts had been unmeaningful. This is pretty harsh. I mean, when you think about it, yeah, it was a failed attack, right? So it didn't achieve what it was designed to achieve. But think about all the guys that died. Uh, it's got to be pretty hard for a regiment to consider the sacrifice of so many of its its soldiers unmeaningful simply because the attack was not a success. And by the way, it was very clear that the general wasn't thinking the attack would be a success at the beginning. So it's pretty harsh for him to, to blame the colonel for not being successful in an attack that he thought would fail. You know, <laughs> welcome to the Union Army, I guess. Uh, anyway, back to, back to the story. In a short time, however, they began to believe that in truth their efforts had been unmeaningful. The youth could see this way heavily upon the entire regiment until the men were like chained animals. The youth developed a calm philosophy for these moments. Oh well, he declared to his friends. He probably didn't see any of it and got angry. He probably decided we were wrong just because we didn't do what he wanted. That's very, very true, probably. Several men came hurrying to them. Their faces showed that they brought great news. Henry, you should have heard, cried one eagerly. You should have heard, repeated another and arranged himself to tell the story. The others formed an excited circle. Well, sir, the storyteller proceeded. The colonel met the lieutenant who was standing near us. It was the best thing I ever heard. The colonel said to the lieutenant, Mr. Hasbrook, who was that lad that carried the flag? There, Fleming, what do you think of that? The lieutenant said right away, that's Fleming, and he's a good soldier. The colonel said, he is indeed a very good man to have. He kept the flag right in front. I saw him. He's a good one. And said the colonel, yes, sir, said the lieutenant. He and a fellow named Wilson were at the front of the attack. Well, said the colonel, they deserve to be major generals. The youth and his friend endured the joking that followed with the greatest of pleasure. They knew that their faces became a deep red from the emotions they felt. They exchanged a secret glance of joy and pride. They quickly forgot many things. The past held no pictures of error and defeat. They were very happy, and their hearts filled with grateful warmth toward the colonel and the youthful lieutenant. So they've been praised for their bravery, and I think this is the irony that, that Crane is trying to get to here. Here's Fleming, who ran away, uh, wandered for an entire day, uh, joined up with the wounded, watched a guy die who was his friend, abandoned another guy to die alone, um, got clubbed in the head by a retreating Union infantryman, uh, told a lie about that clubbing, that he was shot during fighting, rejoined his regiment, and then acted brave in one attack. And now, if only the army had a uh, thousand wildcats like him, uh, they'd be in Richmond by now. Is that true? I mean... So, again, is, is, has Henry changed? Is he now a courageous man? And is that something that's going to stick with him? Is courage a trait that one has? Or is it somebody else's opinion of you? Uh, you know, you got your own self-opinion, then you get to the opinion other people have of you. It seems like Henry has forgotten all about his cowardice, and he's he's really enjoying being thought of as a hero and treated as a hero um, and gaining notoriety. Is that going to stick with him? I don't know. I mean, I'm just throwing some, some ideas out here, but uh, it is interesting how this shakes out and ironic because, you know, most of the novel is about Henry's day as he ran away from battle. And here he is being praised as the most courageous of his unit. All right, we're almost done. Two chapters left, and then the book will be over. So we're going to move on to chapter 21.